All right, what's up guys? Today we're gonna to be talking about how to set up a WireGuard VPN server on a Raspberry Pi 4. All right, so first off, what is WireGuard? WireGuard is similar to OpenVPN, except it does so many things better. First off, it is incredibly fast. It actually came about as a mathematical proof, I believe, from a university research paper. And because of that, it is just blazing fast and it's at a super low level and it's actually built into the Linux kernel. Another great thing that it does is it makes authentication so much easier. It's almost identical to the way you authenticate with SSH keys. So basically when you create a WireGuard user, it generates both a public and a private key. And that is what is used to authenticate. No messing around with certificates, passwords, or anything like that. It is just simply those giant keys that are used to authenticate, and it's very secure. All right, and so to set this up, we're gonna be using PyVPN project again, because it makes setting these things up so easy and make sure everything that needs to get done gets done. All right, and so before you can do this, you need to have three things set up. One, you need the ability to port forward on your router. If you can't port forward on a router, you're just not gonna be able to do this. Next, you're gonna need a Raspberry Pi, which you can SSH into, and you should probably have a static IP address for that. I've got tutorials in the description for how to do that. And finally, you need some address on the internet that always leads to your home's router. I've got a tutorial on how to do this if you don't have a static IP address, which most people in the US do not have a static IP address, using DYNU. Basically, your Raspberry Pi constantly tells DYNU what the IP address of your home is. And they give you address on the internet that anytime they get a request to that address, they just say, oh, that is there. And they point to the IP address that is currently assigned to your home's network. That way, you can always connect back even if the IP address of your house changes because the log will get updated and they will just route you to that new IP address. This is really important to do because if you don't have a static IP address and your IP address changes, you're gonna to have to change the IP address on all of the clients and it's gonna be really annoying and it sucks for anything you wanna do automated. So I'd highly recommend setting that up. All right, and so as I said earlier, we're gonna be using PyVPN. And so the way you install it is with this curl statement. And if you read it, it basically says, okay, go to this address, grab the code that's there, pipe it into bash, which means we're gonna be running things as bash. That means that somebody could have put some code in here that would essentially hack into our Pi and create a very unstable environment, or even worse, open up our home network to intrusion. And so what you should always do, even if you trust the project, is go in and do this and open up and just see what's gonna be run. You, you always wanna go through and just check that everything kind of makes sense. Give it a cursory glance at least, even if it's a trusted project, because you really never know. I've actually already gone through this code before and looked at it and I'm okay with it. And it is a very big project, so I do trust it, but you should do this every single time, especially when you're doing it on random GitHub scripts, because you just don't know who's written them, especially if they only have three or four followers or something like that. Somebody could easily slip one or two lines in there that really screws up your home network. So it's just always good to be wary about these things. But since we trust it, we're gonna go ahead and copy this entire thing. And we're going to go into our SSH session with our Raspberry Pi. So as you can see here, I've already SSH into my Raspberry Pi. So we're just gonna paste that in and hit enter. And it's gonna go through and download it and it actually runs itself as sudo, which is a little bit concerning, which is why you really need to make sure you trust this because it currently has full administrative rights to my Raspberry Pi. And so what it's doing here is it's going through and doing an app update and an app upgrade. So it's actually gonna take a couple minutes, but just let it run its course and it's actually really effective for how it does everything. All right, and so now all my packages are updated and it's pulled down the information it needs. 
And so now it says we're going to transform this into a VPN server. So we're just going to click OK, which is Enter. And then it's telling us we need to make sure we have a static IP address. If you have not set up a static local IP address, which means that your Raspberry Pi always has the same IP address on the local network, you'll have the ability to do that here. So just hit enter and it goes and says, hey, this is currently what's set up. Is this correct? And so I've already got this all set up. So I'm just gonna say yes, because I know I've got this set up properly. And now it's going to ask us which user we'll use to hold our open VPN credentials, which is actually also used for our WireGuard credentials, I believe. But I've only got the one user on there, so it's gonna be Pi. And now it's going through and creating the repo. So now we've got the option to pick between a open VPN server and a WireGuard server. So open VPN was a great open standard for a while. However, WireGuard has just come in and just absolutely done everything perfectly correctly. It's got very stable, great clients for both Mac and PC already. And the code base is something like 1% the size of OpenVPN. And so people have been able to audit it perfectly and it's very, very, very secure and just very fast. And here it even says, we highly recommend using WireGuard. And so that's what we're gonna be doing today. And so now we're actually going to be updating my kernel. So this is going to take a little while. So we're just going to hit enter. And it's going to take quite a while. All right. And so while this is installing and it's taking a very long time because it's a kernel update, I'll talk about why having a VPN server is so nice to do. So this is not the type of VPN that's going to let you pirate movies and stuff like that and not get caught by your ISP because what it's doing is it's creating your own VPN. Basically, it's allowing people from outside of your network to tunnel securely into your network. And so there are two different use cases for this. The first is to protect yourself against man in the middle attacks when you're out and not around your house. Basically, what it allows you to do is gain a secure connection wherever you are in the world back to your home network and basically pipe out all of your traffic through there. And so it's basically like having a tunnel directly to your home network. And so even if you were on Wi-Fi that was corrupted and was trying to steal your data, they would only be able to see this encrypted jargon of data going from your computer to your home's IP address. And they would not be able to see anything within that. And so that way, you know you always have a secure connection. Now this will mean wherever you are in the world, you will be limited by either the speed of the connection where you are or the speed of the upload of your home network because all of the data has to be downloaded then uploaded at your home's IP address for this to work. And generally uploads are a lot slower than downloads. The other use case that I use this for all the time is for automation tasks. I'll have a VPN server set up at my house and then I have a secure backup at my mom's house. And it basically tunnels over the VPN connection back and so it acts as if it's on my local network. This means it can back up securely using an rsync connection with a completely encrypted connection and I can even SSH into the remote client and make sure that everything's running properly. It's a really great setup and it's very secure. This is also great if you have a home NAS. You can either build one with a Raspberry Pi, and I'll leave a link to that in the description, or buy something like a Synology or a QNAP. Then you'd be able to access that over a very secure connection wherever you are in the world. And so it really does become your own personal cloud. All right, and so funny enough, as I was talking about that, it finally finished. And so it says now that we've updated the kernel, we need to go ahead and reboot. And so we're just gonna hit enter for yes. All right, and so it actually is going to have us rerun the installation script because it had to do a full kernel update. So I would go ahead and copy that, or you can always just go back to the site and hit enter. All right, and so now it's gonna take a minute to reboot. But once it's done, just go ahead and SSH back in. All right, and so I've just SSH back in, and I'll go ahead and paste that command back in. And we're just gonna go ahead and hit enter and just rerun everything we just ran. 
up to the point. I'm actually not sure how far it's going to go because this is the first time I had to do a kernel update with this. But just follow the same steps as we did before. And once you get to something new is when I'll start back up again. All right, and so now we're back where we would have started had we not had to do a kernel update. And so now we have to choose what port WireGuard is going to be using. And this is a port you're going to have to be forwarding from your router to your Raspberry Pi. Now, I would recommend just leaving this as 51820 because that's the default and that's what everybody using WireGuard is going to expect. And it just makes things a lot smoother. However, your ISP might block that or other things like that, in which case you might have to modify it. But if you don't have to, don't. And so just go ahead and click enter. And so it's gonna give us confirmation screen. All right, and so now we get to select the DNS provider. And so personally, I like using Google's, and so we're just gonna hit enter. And so if you're using something like a Pi hole, you're gonna to want to enable Pi VPN is local DNS or a custom one. But that's out of the scope of this tutorial. And so I'm just gonna select Google and hit enter. All right, and so now what's blurred out right there is the IP address of my house. And so right now it's saying, hey, this is the IP address I see that's connected to this house. Should we use that? And unless you have a static IP address, meaning your ISP gives you the same IP address every day for the next 50 years, do not select this. Instead, have a DDNS server point to your IP address. This way, the DDNS server name, basically a web address, will always stay the same. And on the back end, you can change the IP address. This is helpful even if you have a static IP address, because say you want to move, but you want everything to work, and you're not going to have the same IP address anymore. Well, you could just update the entry for that DDNS service and have it forward to the new IP address. So I would highly recommend selecting DNS entry. All right, and so this is where you're going to enter the DNS name of the server that you've got set up. And so this is that address that's on the internet that will always be pointing traffic back to whatever IP address your house is at. And so if you've not set this up, set this up with DYNU, and I've got a tutorial on how to do that. But for this tutorial, I'm actually just going to use a local DNS server that I've got set up. So we'll just call it test.example.com. And I've got that set up to forward to my Raspberry Pi. All right, and so now it's going to generate us the server keys. And it's going to tell us, hey, you need to have automatic updates on because this thing is exposed to the internet. And so I would highly recommend setting this up because you're going to end up forgetting about it. And so say yes. All right, and so now we're done with the installation. It's probably going to have us reboot. But we now have it set up. So once you go ahead and reboot, go ahead and SSH back in, and we're going to go ahead and create our first certificate. All right, and so now we've SSH back in. And so all we have to do is do a really simple Pi VPN and just add. And so we just enter a name for the client. We'll call it Will. And just like that, we've created the public and the private keys. So I'm going to show them here, but don't worry, I will have reset all of this and it's all going to be different. So there's no issue there, but you should not be sharing these keys unless you know they're going to be deleted or you want the person to use them. All right. And so let's go in and check out the config files. And so it's will.config and so we'll just do a simple cat to see it. And so what it's done is it's made it incredibly easy to share this. You can either do a secure copy and copy it over over SSH, or honestly, you can just go in and copy it and paste it into a document on your computer, however you want to do it. And so I'll go over these real quick. So first off, the private key, this is that secure key that every single client gets. And then on the server, there's the public key. And if the public and the private key match based off of some very special math, that means that it is authenticated. Then the address is the address that this client is going to be given. It should not be on the same domain as your network because it's just going to cause issues. 
And so you might have to change that. And if you do change that, make sure to change it on the WireGuard config file. Then the DNS server is who's going to be resolving all the DNS stuff. And so 8.8.8.8 is Google's. And then right here, the public key, pre-shared key. And then right here, the endpoint should be the address of your house. So basically test.example.com needs to point to my home's IP address and colon, and that's the port that WireGuard is listening on. Finally down here, allowed IPs. So 000 basically says any IP addresses are allowed through. So this is that circumstance where you want all traffic going to this network. So this is that example where you want to route all your traffic to your home's network. And so that is what you can do there. However, you might not want to do that because it will be slow and unnecessary, especially if you have multiple people connecting. And so say you just want traffic going to your LAN going through this. Well, we can just go ahead and edit this file. I'm using nano. And so say I only want my local traffic to go through there. I'm just going to delete the IP6 stuff because I don't use it and it gets very confusing. And I'm going to change this allowed IPs to my subnet. And so basically, I use the subnet 192.168.1 as my IP addresses. And so that slash 24 is what's called the subnet mask. And slash 24 means you can vary any of the values on that last period. Anything after the last period will be varied. So between one and 255. And so that's what matches with my home's router setup. All right, quick retraction. I forgot when I was doing this, that under allowed IP addresses, if you are limiting traffic just to your LAN's IP addresses, you also need to include the subnet of whatever the VPN is. And so it's just comma separated, add in a comma, and then whatever this address is right here, you just copy that and put it right here. And that way you will be able to also go to your VPN through the VPN connection. If you don't, it's not going to work. All right, back to the regular video. And now before we copy this, let's just go ahead and check out the config files. So they're in uh, etc wireguard. Oh, you actually have to be root access to even get to the folder. So do a sudo su and go into it. And this wireguard zero is the config file for the master server. And so this sets up our network. And there are some additional options you can do here. If you would like easy forwarding, I'll put a link in the description for overall what they are, but I've got them copied here, which basically just helps update the IP tables and helps forwarding easily. And so just go ahead and paste those in there. It makes it a lot easier. So as we can see here, this one is for the will certificate and it's allowed IP addresses are 10.6.0.2 with a subnet mask of 32, which means it's only that one digit that is allowed to change. And so it's only going to be allowed to have that IP address. If you would like it to be able to request its own, you can change that, but I would just leave it. And so we're gonna do control X exit, yes, save, enter. All right, and you can also go through here and look at the configs and the keys but that's all up to you and what you want to look around at. And now we're going to exit out of sudo su because being a root user is not a good idea unless you need to be. So we're just going to do exit and we are back in the configs file. And so now we're going to do a PWD to make sure we know how to get to this and an exit. And so now we've exited back to our local computer. And so we're going to copy these keys to my current computer using SCP. And so we've exited out into my computer's terminal. And so we're going to just CD into the desktop folder. And so now we're in our desktop. So we're going to do it SCP. And basically it's just a copy over the SSH connection. So you use your regular SSH authentication for the Raspberry Pi and then give it the location. 
And so that's why I did that PWD was to see the exact location. So it's home pi configs and slash will dot config. And we just want to copy it directly to the desktop. So we'll do a period there. All right, so sorry about that. Um, I had to reset my Pi there for some reason. It just was not allowing me to SSH back in, but now it should work. Okay, good. Yeah, it, it was just being weird there for a second. So I just pulled the plug out and plugged it back in and everything's honky dory now. All right, and so now if we check out, there's this will.config file that was successfully copied over. And so this is the VPN config file and it's super easy to use. So we're just gonna go ahead and open up WireGuard. And this is just a app that WireGuard makes for Mac. And I believe they've also got a good PC variant and on Linux is just built in. And so just click import tunnels from file. Select this guy and import it. We'll allow it. And it is super easy to use. So just click activate. And just like that, it has activated it. So now we'll go into our network up here. And we'll see that we've got this IP address 10.6.0.2 and it's able to send and receive from that. It is just super easy to use. And now we are set up. All right, and so it's really just that simple to use. Make sure you forwarded that WireGuard port from your router to your Raspberry Pi's IP address to make sure that any traffic hitting that domain is directed to your Pi correctly. And overall, that's a pretty basic setup for this WireGuard VPN configuration. It's really easy to use and allows you to connect back to your home network securely, really fast, and really easily. Go ahead and put any of the other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below, and have a good one. Bye.